I know, that's the Kashi's work in equality. This is a second. Welcome back. This is the Tudor Wizard. Please subscribe right here. I'm Adrian. This is Petra. She's, I know, just like all the other, she doesn't want to be doing math right now. Just like half of the people watching. Why are you watching the video? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. So what we're going to do today is linear algebra one. Chapter four is ve the vector space Rn. Specifically today, what we're going to do is what we call a Euclidean n space and inner product spaces. This lecture, what we're going to do is define an inner product. The Euclidean n space, specifically for Rn and an inner product, is going to give us a Euclidean space. And then we're going to do several properties, the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, the triangle inequality, the Pythagorean theorem in n dimensions, and possibly, I'm supposed to save a couple of these for you to do for your homework, but I can't help myself. I'll probably do the parallelogram law and all of these types of things as well. Let's get to it. Definition, let V be any vector space. Our vector space in this course and in this playlist essentially is going to be Rn, but you can get other vector spaces, the space of all polynomials of degree at most n, the set of all matrices, the set of all vectors is what we're going to usually use when you can get these weird abstract vector spaces. What's a vector space? Remember, a vector space over R means that you're computing with the scalars are going to be the real numbers you're multiplying by. You have an addition of your objects. You have a scalar multiplication by real numbers of your objects, and they satisfy those 10 axioms that we did in the previous video. Now what we're going to do is we want to create, we have the dot product and the cross product. The dot product is actually an arbitrary case of an inner product. So we're trying to generalize essentially the scenario of what a dot product is, but you can have, unbeknownst to you, many different kinds of inner products on the same space. So what is an inner product? It's a number. So even though it has this horrible symbol, or even when we did ours originally, when we did x dot y, that, we always say if it has a line on it, they're vectors. But as soon as I combine them, at, unfortunately, yes, the symbol has vectors in them. But that is now, because I'm taking two of them, it's creating a number. It's assigning a number. So this inner product is a function. You can actually view it as what it actually is, is a function which goes from where? It goes from Rn cross Rn, takes two vectors, x and y. And what does it spit out? It spits out their inner product, x and y. So you get a number. So it's technically a map which goes from Rn cross Rn into the real numbers. That's the fancy way of saying what's the input. The input is two vectors in my vector space. The outcome is just a real number. And it has to satisfy, don't worry, we're going to go, the dot product we're going to use is the regular dot products from the lower cases for dimension 1, 2, and 3. It's the same for any dimension n. What do we have to have for this to be called an inner product? That function has to satisfy these four axioms or these four properties. It has to be symmetric. So x dot y or x inner product y is the same thing as y inner product x. There's also an external product, which we're not going to get into. That's why it's called the inner product. And then we have to have linearity, bilinear. It has to be linear in both coordinates. But by using this, you can flip it around so that you could also show that it's true. So what that says is you can split sums of your inner product. And this one says you can spit out scalars of your inner product. And because we can commute also because of this one, you can pull it out of either coordinate, move the constants to the front, it's telling us. And then this one says it's positive definite. Regardless of whatever you put in there, especially when you put x in there, you can't do x inner product itself and get a negative number or zero. Or you can get zero, but the only way to get zero in the inner product, notice that this is a number, so it's the number zero. You can get that with yourself if and only if the vector itself is zero. So this is what an inner product is. In general, we're going to use the normal dot product for our inner product, but there are other ones using integration or any of these types of things. And what we call a Euclidean n space is Rn and any dot product that you cook up that creates a new inner product space. So if I use regular dot product, that's one copy of inner product space. If I use some weird integrals or something like this, that would be this, I'm using the same set, but that set with a different inner product is a new inner product or Euclidean n space. We're gonna stick with basically Rn and the regular dot product, which is the sum of the product of the coordinates when I have two vectors. Let's do a bunch of the properties and remind you of this is all the same note. We have a slightly different notation. We have to use these brackets, the bra and the ket. Essentially in physics, we're using this notation, which is the bra and the ket operators. But essentially what that does is still in quantum mechanics, what they're saying is they take two geometric vectors and it's creating a number by adding together the bra and the ket vectors. You get a number out of that scenario. In our case, we're just going to use a slightly altered version of this 
So it's not going to look like this all the time. It's going to look like this, but essentially the one we're going to use is that guy. So I'll probably go back to the dot product notation. Either way, let's get to a bunch of the properties. All right, so I'm going to go through about six remarks. Here's the first four or five. First of all, what we're going to do is this is for all intents and purposes what we're doing in this class because we're always going to use RN, not some weird abstract vector space. RN is probably abstract enough for you. We're going to use the regular dot product as our inner product. So I'm going to use interchangeably or probably go right quickly back to using the bullet or the dot product instead of the angled brackets because at first everyone's brain is like, why is this this angled bracket? And it's harder to deal with and do algebra with it. So it's easier with this dot product business. So I'll go back to that. So if these mean the same thing for me now when I'm doing my discourse. Also, we want to flesh out in n dimensions. We already did this in one and two and three dimensions, but what is length now in n dimensions? The norm of a vector is still the square root of the inner product with itself. And because I said we're going to interchange, usually I'm just going to say that's the square root of x dot x. Notice we don't have the coordinates of the vectors and therefore we don't know how to actually compute this thing yet, but this is how we compute norm in Rn. Also, using our guide from the first three dimensions, the angle between them, we actually define dot product as x, norm of x times norm of y times the cosine. And then if you divide by both of these because they're non-zero, you get an access to the angle between them. Technically, the angle between them, theta, is arc cos of that thing, inner product xy over norm of x times norm of y. And you use your magic calculator to use arc cos of some value. Appreciate calculator, that's harder to do than you think. So now we have a way of computing angles between two vectors in Rn. And the one, the most important one on here probably for you is we now finally have, regardless of the canonical basis in n dimensions that we have, if there's some ambient basis there, how did these guys get coordinates? They got their coordinates from the linear combinations in that basis, but now, yay, they have coordinates. How do I add and do all those things coordinate-wise? How do we take the inner product or dot product of those two vectors in n dimensions? You multiply these coordinates together, you multiply the second coordinate together, all the way down to you multiply the last coordinate together, then you add it up. So this is the most important one. This is how you compute inner products in n dimensions when the vectors have coordinates. Then we need orthogonal projections is the same. It's just going to have more coordinates, everything. And we use that different symbol. But the projection of x onto y as a vector is x inner product y over the norm of y squared, which is just a number now. Remember, inner product is a number. Norm is a square root of an inner product, so that's a number. And so this whole thing is the scalar multiple times y. And that's how we create projections. The last two things I need are, we want that Pavlovian orthogonality condition for n dimensions, and we wanna know what a unit vector is, because we really wanna know ve when vectors have length one, and we want, really wanna know when vectors are orthogonal to each other. So let's do the last two properties. So the other two conditions we have is, number five is the orthogonality condition. This should become Pavlovian or Freudian. You can make it dirty if you want, I don't really care, but just memorize it. Vectors are orthogonal in n dimensions if and only if their inner product is zero, it's a dot product. Unit vectors are also going to be extremely important to us. I can't quite get there in a first linear algebra class, but in a linear algebra two class, we always do the Gram-Schmidt process, which finds an orthonormal basis in n dimensions with orthonormal basis. Turns out there's infinitely many bases for each space, and some bases are better than others. It's not, there's so many of them, which are the good ones? Orthonormal ones, what does that mean? They're all orthogonal to each other, so this could be a basis of the plane, but then I want the good one, i and j, the ones that are perpendicular to each other, and what's the length of i? Square root of one squared plus zero squared is one. What's the square root of j? Square root of zero squared plus one squared. Oh, so their lengths are one, and they're orthogonal. This is what we call an orthonormal basis. Finding the coefficients of other vectors in, with respect to an orthonormal basis is the bee's knees. It's extremely slick. You're gonna have to watch Linear Algebra 2 videos, and you'll find out how that happens. But in that condition, we always want unit vectors. The Gram-Schmidt process is how you find them perpendicular, and that's clever. We, and we have to use orthogonal projections onto lower spaces in a, these entire spaces. So we'll get into how do you do orthogonal projection onto multiple vectors, not just one. Take two, linear algebra two, and we'll see. But th that's the hard part. The easy part is then making all of those vectors that you created that are orthogonal to each other, length one. Divide by their norm in each case, and then you have an orthonormal basis. So finding an orthogonal basis is difficult. Finding an orthonormal basis is for free. You just divide by their lengths and you have unit you know, vectors which are all orthogonal to each other, orthonormal. That was a long way of saying a unit vector is an easy definition. Unit vectors have length one. But if I have a vector in space, 
and I want a unit vector in the direction of this vector, how am I going to get it? I divide this vector by its length, and I will always get that the norm of u will be 1. No one believes you either, but watch, using properties, what is this? Well, what's the norm of u? The norm of u is the norm of x over the norm of x. But this is a number, which is a positive number, so I can take it out of the norm in absolute value using the norm property. So this becomes 1 over the norm of x times what's left on the inside, the norm of x, which is something over something, which is 1. If you divide a vector by its length, that outcome vector is always a unit vector. And this is extremely useful. There's the freeness of doing the Gram-Schmidt process. Finding them orthogonal is a difficult part. Making them unit vectors is easy once you know what's going on. Now let's do all of the, let's do an example of some of these things in four dimensions. We've done these calculations in three dimensions and two dimensions, so we'll pick some four vectors in R4 and do a bunch of these properties and calculations. Then we'll do the three is nicest. There, I got a bunch of properties, but we're definitely going to do cauchy schwartz triangle inequality, and Pythagoras theorem in n dimensions. I might want to do a couple of parallelogram laws, etc., etc. How to use this algebra now in our clever notation to prove things about the structure of that space in n dimensions. Let's get to it. All right, example one, we've got now got a couple vectors in four space. So both of these guys are in R4. And now what we want, to, how do I know that? Because they all have four coordinates, but I've been given two vectors in four space. So they are never a basis because they can't span all of four space. They are linearly independent of each other. So they span a plane in four space, but they can't be a basis for four space. I couldn't help myself. They have four coordinates. Now what do they want me to do? Compute the inner product of x and y, compute the norm of x and the norm of y, compute the projection of x onto y as a vector, find a unit vector in the direction of y. There's actually two unit vectors, because the direction we mean this direction, whether it's pointed the same way or oppositely, they can find two unit vectors in the direction of y, and then find the angle between them. Which one do we want to do first? Let's go backwards. Okay, we'll start with one. How do I find this? Why am I doing this first? This is what I need. This is inner product x, y over normal y squared times y. So that's the pieces I need to build this guy. So 1. What is the inner product of x and y? This is now the inner product of 2, negative 1, 0, 3, comma. Nobody likes it when you put them in there, but it helps a whole lot. What was y? 1, 3, 1, 4. What does that say now? Whether it's before we would just put the dot product there, but now what is it? I do 2 times 1 plus negative 1 times 3 plus 0 times 1 plus 3 times 4, which is going to give me what? I get 12, 13, 14 minus 3 is 11. A number. I know it's hard to see in our notation, but when you actually go to calculate with coordinates, it's the number 11. It's just two sticks, so there, now he's 11. What's next? I need the norm. I don't actually need this one. I need that one, but we'll calculate both that it told me to. Now, what do I need? I need the norm of x. The norm of x is technically the square root of the inner product of x with itself, which is going to be what? This will be the square root of x1 squared dot 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 plus xn squared, they say, is the magic formula. If I think about that for a second, I think that's the clever one I forgot to put into our remarks. But either way, what does that say? I have x1, x2, x3, x4. So this will be the square root of 2 squared plus negative 1 squared plus 0 squared plus 3 squared, which is going to be the square root of 4 plus 1 plus 0 plus 3, which is the square root of 8, which is 2 root 2, but you can leave it alone if you want. Then what do I want? I want to compute the norm of y. The norm of y is equal to the square root of y1 squared plus y2 squared plus y3 squared plus y4 squared. I regurgitate so my mind rememorizes it. Rememorizes it. Patent pending, patent pending. I can make English words up, not the math. We discover the math, not make it up. So what do I get? I get the square root of 1 squared plus 3 squared plus 
one squared plus four squared. Oh, is Mark cleverly, I stole this from Mark's book because I'm lazy, but is he cleverly picking up a perfect square? Try to get that where that works out most of the time. I think he did. Let's see. No, it's the square root of 27. Then I'm going to square it, so that's okay. So what do I get? Square root of one plus nine plus one plus 16, which is the square root of 27, which again is three root three, but I'll leave it like that. So what am I going to now do with that? I'm going to use this guy and this number to compute the projection. Let's move everything up and erase it first though. Cameraman, after I erase everything, points out just like students do, they let me fill the whole board and then they're like, oh, back at the beginning that should have been a two. It's like, why did you wait? So in one of the calculations, I think I had it wrong. So let's try to compute the norm of X. I throw the editor and the cameraman on the bus now. So why wait till I've erased it and then point out that I made a mistake? So what should it be? It should be two squared plus negative one squared plus zero squared plus three squared, which I didn't square this guy apparently. So bad on me, I minus one. So I get four plus one plus zero plus nine, which is gonna be what? The square root of 14. So there, it's not the square root of eight, it's the square root of 14 because I didn't square that guy. Now I can go back to doing the rest of what I wanted. What was the rest of what I wanted? Now I want to do the projection of x onto y. What is that going to be? I, I, I. This will be the projection of x onto y as a vector. Using my formula is the inner product of x and y over the norm of y squared times y. This was, you can go back and look, when you go back to look to see that I didn't square the three, you can see that this was what? x and y, x dot y was 11. The norm of y was the square root of 27, so the norm squared is just 27. So this should be over 27 times y, which is 1, 3, 1, 4. That is the projection. Yeah, once you know how to compute the pieces, this is it. This is it. If you really want to, you can multiply that in there and get 11 over 27 and 33 over 27, I'm not reducing, and 11 over 27, and 4 over 44 over 27. But I would leave it like this. That hot junk is just a number multiplied by the original vector. So this is projection. Now what do I want? I want a unit vector in the direction of <coughs> y. So what is y? We already found that the norm of y was equal to the square root of 27. So the unit vector in this direction, or a unit vector, is y over its norm, which is 1 over the square root of 27 times 1, 3, 1, 4. That vector has norm 1 when you compute this. And then what's the last one that we're going to compute? The angle between theta and x and y. So the last one we need, we thought it didn't matter because we had the error, but well, now I need the norm of x and would have been wrong, and everyone would have been like, it should have been a 3 in there. So cosine of the angle between them, and now you'll realize you should appreciate your calculator because unless you're using the unit circle and we cook these numbers up really nicely, which we didn't in this case, good luck finding cosine of whatever horrible number we get here. So what do we get? This was x dot y was 11. The norm of x computed correctly, again, this is a good moral, it might take you more than one try, you're going to make little mistakes, but as long as you know the theory along the way, you should be okay. What was this one correctly? Now I don't remember, it was the square root of 14. I say I don't remember as I write the right answer out, and then it was the square root of 27. That's it. The only thing I can do is what Mark does where I just cheated and looked, he does this clever move, he says it's the root 14, and then it's 3 root 3. And then he does 3 times 14. This is 11 over 3 root 42. I wanted to put the 42 in there because that's my age and it's the meaning of life and everything. So there it is. This is that. And so what the angle actually between them? The angle is, just like I said, you'd have to do arc cos of 11 over 3 root 42, which will take an entire other calculus course to figure out how to actually do that. I would need the power series expansion of arc cos and then put that number in there and then use successive approximation to that. I don't know what it is. What's sine of 1? No, sine of pi over 2 is 1. What's sine of 1 radian? I don't know, 0 0.707 or something like that. Some irrational transcendental number that I would use the power series. So, appreciate your calculator. I know now that you're watching, take your calculator on your phone and compute what that thing is. Or here it is, wait, I'll do it. We're going to have to edit because I'm really slow with the technology. Calculator. We're going to have to use, do they even have art codes in here? They don't even have our codes on this calculator. How are we going to do it? 
hands to the air. Appreciate your calculator. So uh, you can calculate. It'll give you some number. Make sure your calculator is in radians, not degrees. It won't know what you're talking about. So this is radians. There's the angle. That's as far as I'm going. Yes, it's okay for you to leave it like that on an exam. I'll give you full credit. Now let's do the th at least three properties about Euclidean end spaces, Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, the triangle inequality, Pythagorean identity in n dimensions. When do we have a, the norm of a squared plus b squared equals c squared? Or we're going to phrase it as vectors, if and only if they're orthogonal. <laughs> Two of the vectors have to be perpendicular. And then we have the parallelogram law and all these things I could keep talking. Let's get to it. All right. The first theorem is called the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. What it says is for any two vectors in Rn, where you have an inner product, so a Euclidean n space, the absolute value of the inner product is always less than or equal to the product of the norms. Actually, the absolute value doesn't really matter anyways, but if, it was, if the inner product is negative, it's definitely going to be less than or equal because these are always positive. So these are greater than zero, and if it was negative, then it would definitely be true. But even if you take the absolute value, they're saying even if it's positive, it'll still be less than these two norms. How do we get this? We get this using the quadratic formula and the discriminant of a quadratic function by making a clever substitution. So let's prove this. It's extremely exciting or at least we know that it will work. What we're going to do is let some other vector v be t times x minus y for some t in r. This is what we're going to do. We're going to create a polynomial in t, and then we're going to use the norm of x and y as the coefficients in this. What does that give us? That's going to give us the fact that first I'm using properties of inner product. We know that because v was a vector that we created. Scalar multiplication still creates a geometric vector. Addition still creates a geometric vector. So this is still in Rn. And therefore, what do we know? Just using our properties of inner product, that thing has to be positive. But what does that give me? Knowing that that inner product with itself has to be positive, it now is going to give me an equation. What we have to have is, or an inequality, what is v dot with itself? That will be tx minus y, inner product with tx minus y has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now I'm going to use the clever properties of inner product and foil all of this out. I'm going to get, when I do the properties, I won't do them here because I'm doing the proof. I'll do it in an example in a second. But what I'm doing is I'm using the properties of inner product to write this as t squared, norm of x squared, minus two times t times the inner product of x and y plus negative and negative is going to give me norm of y squared it has to be greater than or equal to zero. What that does for me is it's telling me that this polynomial in t now, if you can think about the t variable, so we have a t and a t squared, and a two. This is now a polynomial in t these are just a, this is a number, this is a number, this is a number, this is a number. Whatever they are, those are just numbers. Those are the A, B, C and the coefficients of A, T squared plus B, T plus C is, has to be greater than or equal to zero. This is saying that the parabola now has to be greater than, at most it might touch, but it's going to be greater than or equal to zero. When am I going to get that? That's going to be if and only if I never have, or when am I going to get strictly larger than zero? That's going to be as if the parabola had never touched the x-axis. So I need the discriminant. When does that happen? When there was no real roots. So with the discriminant of this thing has to be negative. So that's my next step is what is that going to imply? For this polynomial to always be strictly greater than zero or greater than or equal to zero, I have to have that my discriminant is negative. And that's where I'm going to get my conditions. So let's erase and then we'll move this to the top. All right, so I moved it up. And the best way to see that, I don't know if I explained that very well, but here in purple, that's the general, we have a quadratic formula. A t squared plus b t plus c has to be greater than or equal to zero. When is that going to happen? That means that we're just barely or not at all interacting with the x-axis, which means it has almost no real roots. And when are we going to have that? You have no real roots if your discriminant is negative, the thing underneath the square root when we use the quadratic formula. So now here's an actual useful application of this. If this is the scenario for this guy, if this is a and this is b and this is c, Rephrasing that, our discriminant using these values has to be less than or equal to zero. And then what am I going to get with this? This says immediately 
let's do this first of all this says that ignoring the d part this says that 4 x y squared the inner product is less than or equal to moving this guy to the other side 4 norm of x squared times norm of y squared i can get rid of the 4 now and so what is that going to give me that's going to give me that the inner product of x y squared is less than or equal to the norm of x squared times the norm of y squared I'm going to take the square root of both sides, and that's going to give me the result. That's going to say, even in absolute value, if I want, the norm of x times the norm of y is going to be less than or equal to x times the norm of y. So, using this clever quadratic formula, knowing that this statement has to be the discriminant is negative, tells us that using those specific things, because these are all numbers, cleverly gets me to the statement that is known as the cauchy schwarz inequality. The inner product is always less than or equal to the, two, the product of the two norms of the vectors. This is extremely useful and almost a corollary. The triangle inequality will almost fall out of using the same similar clever trick of squaring a norm and then using the cauchy schwarz inequality, I can get the triangle inequality, which is next. I guess I could have used one of the avatars of integers to be like theorem two. It doesn't matter. Triangle inequality. What is this going to be? Why is it a triangle inequality, first of all? Because if I use my notation of linear algebra now to define that a tri this triangle has sides which are determined by the vector x and the vector y, the length of those sides are actually the norm of x and the norm of y. But who's this vector? That's x plus y. So the length of this side in the triangle are, is the norm of x plus y. So now those horrible symbols are just a, B, C, the sides of a triangle. And in Euclidean geometry, also you should go to Mark Solomonovich's YouTube channel, Teaching 8, I think, something like this. I'll get better at calling those out, but you can find it if you really want. He does Euclidean geometry also, and in there, as a consequence of Euclidean geometry, what we're saying is the length of one side of a triangle is always less than the sum of the other two, less than or equal to. When would it be equal when there's no triangle and they're collinear? So, in our statement, algebraically, this is the length of a triangle, the side of a triangle, and so are these. And what it's saying is the length of one side is always less than or equal to the sum of these. Not using the triangle scenario, here's a question that bothered me the first time it was posed. If and when do I get equality in this statement? It's always less than or equal, but when do I get actually equals? What this really says is, I like this as the parable as its norm is reflect symmetric. So my grandma used to argue this point to me, but it's not true. It's just as takes just as long for me to go to her house as it does for her to come to my house. It's the same distance, but I have to go there because her food is better. So I'm going to end up going to her. But if I now, so you're going to get a quality when they're collinear. But if I have to stop at the store before I go to my grandma's, then that distance is going to be longer than just going straight there. But the only way I could do that is if the store was right on the street and I just put up my hand and grab the milk first and then I wouldn't have to stop. So the moral of that is the only way we're going to get equality here is if the two vectors were collinear and then x plus y is just going to be this vector and then they're actually equal to them. Otherwise you're going to get strictly less. Let's prove why this is true. What are we going to do to prove it? The dirty trick always is we're going to use cauchy schwarz inequality and whenever I want to look at a norm of something it's often useful to, especially in physics and everything else, square it and see what happens. That was an inside joke just for one person. All right, proof. And when you get lazy it's just poof now. Poof. How do I do this? I'm going to square it and then take the square root at the end. So what is this squared? And I'll go back to my nicer notation of dot product because nobody likes seeing this in inner product. So this is x plus y dot product with x plus y. Remember, the norm of a vector is equal to the square root of x dot x. So an extremely another Pavlovian almost should be that the norm of x squared is equal to x dot x. And that's where we always use this clever trick, and that's what I'm using right here. My vector is now x plus y, but if I'm going to square that, it should be x plus y dot product with itself. Now that I have that, what am I going to get? 
I'm going to use properties of inner product. So I'll go slow this time. This one in the last one, I just sped through it. And you're like, how did you get that last line on the Kashi Schwartz and the quality? Okay, I'll do it slower. This I'm viewing as one vector. And it says if you have dot product with this, you can distribute this guy into both and it'll be the inner product with those. And then I'm going to do it twice from the right, just a second. So I'm viewing that and I know this is why you can't see the move at first. I'm viewing X plus Y as one vector. And in this part, I'm viewing them as two vectors. <laughs> so I'm going to distribute this vector onto both of those guys. And that's going to be X plus Y dot product with X plus, I'm allowed to know X plus Y dot product with y. So that was that move, which is one of the properties that you're allowed to use for inner product. Now what I'm going to do is the same thing in reverse twice. So now what do I get? This one will give me equals x dot product with x plus y dot product with x. And then when I do it here, I'm going to get plus x dot product with y plus y dot product with x y with itself. Now I'm using the properties. Am I allowed to flip that around? Yes. x dot y is y dot x. So I'll go slow. And what is this guy? I already want to speed it up. x dot product with itself is norm of x squared. So this one is norm of x squared. This one I can flip around and this one plus this one will be two something. So I have two x dot y plus norm of y squared. Same thing, but now here's where Kashi Schwartz says that that is less than or equal to norm of x times norm of y. So by Kashi Schwartz inequality, this is less than or equal to norm of x squared plus two times norm of x times norm of y plus norm of y squared. And what is that? It's the square of a sum. Now what do I have? That thing squared is less than or equal to this thing squared. So if I take the square root of both sides, I'll write it up there. So after you get that hot mess, what am I going to do? After I've proved, convinced myself that it's true, I erase and I say, well, I just found that this was less than or equal to norm of x plus norm of y squared. So if I take the square root again, I'm going to get triangular inequality. Stratum, what it was that I was supposed to show. I didn't just walk away. That means I've done the proof. I didn't just give up. Well, I don't want to do this anymore. We always want to do more. And in particular, we're going to do at least two more. Let's do now, what was the one I didn't do? Pythagoras theorem in n dimensions. Mark is going to be like, you're supposed to let them try some of these. I want to prove them all. I'm going to. Theorem, the n dimensional Pythagorean theorem. So Pythagoras is probably one of the most well known theorems of all, and I can get grade students to regurgitate it, probably not the way that I like to regurgitate it, but the sum of the square of the legs in any right triangle is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. Yeah, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's true in any dimension, not just the plane, it turns out. So take any two vectors in Rn. If they're orthogonal, remember, this has to be in a right triangle. Otherwise, you have the cosine law. A squared plus B squared equals C squared minus AB times cosine of the angle between them. Yeah, the cosine law. <laughs> if the angle is 90 degrees, cos is zero, and you get A squared plus B squared equals C squared. This happens in any dimension now, and this is why we shell shock you always, because you can't see that because of our horrible notation. But think about what we're trying to do. We describe triangles and all these other kinds of objects using this notion of vectors and norm. So if I have this vector as one of the sides of the right triangle, then this length is norm of x. And then if we have perpendicular vectors, y, it will be the other side of the triangle. And that's the length of y. And of course, the diagonal, the hypotenuse, is going to be the longest one, which is equal to norm of x plus y, which we know is always less than or equal. Now we're saying we have equality when we square those. This is Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. How am I going to get that? I'm going to do the same dirty trick. And I'm going to look at, even in this one, it actually tries to show you. What I'm going to do is start with the norm of x plus y squared. And as long as you remember, as a Pavlovian reflex, the norm of a vector squared is its inner product with itself. So this has to be x plus y 
dot product with x plus y. And now you saw me foil this out, so what is this going to give me after I foil and I'm allowed to use the properties? Yes, this will give me x dot x plus y dot x plus, I was going to do it really fast, but I'll go intermediately slow, plus y dot y. So foil this one into there and then foil the other ones out and you'll get this. Then you have to remember in our notation, what does that mean? That's what I just used. <laughs> That's the norm of x squared. This is the norm of y squared. This one that I can flip around. So this will be equal to the norm of x squared plus 2 times x dot y plus the norm of y squared, which is equal to the norm of x squared plus the norm of y squared. And I'm done. How did I do the last step? This is zero. Vectors are orthogonal in n dimensions if and only if the dot product is zero. So that term goes away and you get magically what? If those two vectors are orthogonal, then you get the norm of x plus y squared is equal to the norm of x squared plus the norm of y squared. That just seems like a magic property when you're using our notation and our vectors. But all that's saying is you have the sum of the square of the legs is equal to the square of the hypotenuse in any right triangle. I don't care what dimension you're in now. Let's do the parallelogram law and then we might get an, I don't know, I've got some properties. Let's at least do the parallelogram law then. All right, last theorem. I was going to let you do it and then walk away, but I don't know. I can't help myself. I really want to prove it and show you. Hopefully you see that I'm genuinely enjoying myself here. I don't know what you're in this for, probably because you had to take the course and you've been forced to, but try to shake yourself out of that once in a while and be like, oh, this is awesome. And I'm just going to thoroughly enjoy myself proving one more of these, or I might let you try it. I'll start it off. What does it say? Why do they call it the parallelogram law? Again, if you don't look at the picture, you're like, what? The? This doesn't make any sense. But now when I look at the picture a little bit and I look at a parallelogram law, hopefully it came from a parallelogram law or why are they talking about it? Draw your picture, says Mark. If I did, and it looks like parallelogram opposite sides are equal to each other. So that this is the norm of X, this side, and this is the norm of X. These two sides are the norm of Y. And the two diagonals happen to be X plus Y and X minus Y. Go watch one of our previous videos in chapter three. And we have where I show that the diagonals of a parallelogram are in the span of the sides. It's like what? They're linear combinations of each other we showed. So once I do that, that's how we get those. The diagonal, I don't have to write D1 and D2. I know it's X plus Y and X minus Y. Now what I'm gonna do, they say that the square of these two diagonals, so this is this diagonal, this is this diagonal, it says the square of those diagonals is two times the square of the sides of a parallelogram in rhetoric. Now, but now in algebra, hopefully you see where I'm going to try to leave you off with this. What am I going to do with this? Well, I'm just going to open up this side and open up this side, and hopefully everything will simplify and give me this side. So what do I do? I want to look at the norm of x plus y squared, and I want to look at the norm of x minus y squared. What is this one? This one is my Pavlovian reflux inner product of x plus y by, with itself. So this should be x plus y dot product with x plus y. This one is going to, it looks like I'm proving it. It's going to be x minus y dot product with x minus y. What is that going to give me? Dot, dot, dot. Okay, I will leave it for you. This is going to give me, you'll get 2 norm of x squared plus 2 norm of y squared. You can factor out the 2 and then you're done. So, proof goes here. If you want to fill in the proof, then you can link it below or something like that. But I will see you next time. Please subscribe right here. I don't know where it is. I think the subscription bell's right there. And then there's a bell next to it if you want the notifications. I don't know what any of that means. See you next time.